Upon its completion, the Panama Canal became an instant game changer for global shipping. Prior to its construction in the early 1900s, the quickest way to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific by boat oh, is going all the way underneath South America, a trip that is not only incredibly long, but one that also takes you through some of the roughest seas on Earth, such as the Drake Passage. Slicing a waterway through Central America's land changed all of that, with the added benefit of providing some sweet, sweet revenue to whoever owns the canal, with Panama gathering two and a half billion dollars in 2023 from the shipping lane alone. But if all goes according to plan, Panama may soon have a bit of competition on the horizon. In the last few years, Mexico has revived a centuries-old project to create their own streamlined shipping lane, connecting the oceans with the ambitious goal of being both faster and cheaper than the Panama Canal. This is the Inter-Oceanic Corridor of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And today, we're going to dive into the history and the massive scope of the project, how much has been completed thus far, and the huge economic boom this ocean and railway corridor could bring to Mexico in the coming years. Just before we continue today, do you ever feel that your personal information is out there for everyone to see? Well, that's probably because it is. Data brokers are collecting and selling your personal details from your home address to your online activity. But do not worry, that's where today's sponsor, Incogni, comes in. Incogni is your personal data protector, reaching out to data brokers to get your information removed and keeping it off the market. Imagine not having to worry about identity theft or annoying robocalls. Incogni does all of the heavy lifting so you can just kick back and relax. Here's how it works. First, you create an account and tell Incogni whose data you want to remove. Next, you grant them the right to act on your behalf. Then just relax as their team does the work. Incogni contacts data brokers, handles objections, and keeps you updated every step of the way. With Incogni, the stress of having your identity stolen can be avoided. They make sure your data stays protected so you don't have to go through that nightmare. And if you're still on the fence, Incogni offers a risk-free 30-day trial. Try it out, and if you're not happy, you can get a full refund. Plus, with the promo code MEGAPROJECTS, you can get 60% off an annual plan. Just go to incogni.com slash megaprojects. So take your personal data back with Incogni. It's easy, effective, and it gives you peace of mind. Thanks to them for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. The idea of forging a shipping lane through Mexico is certainly not a new one. All the way back in the 1500s, the Spanish crown recognized the potential for such a venture and correctly identified the Isthmus as the most suitable place for it, as this is the point where the Gulf of Mexico gets the closest to the Pacific Ocean. Vague talks of connecting the oceans it went on for years with interest expressed by various world powers. But the first concrete plans were published by a German geographer named Alexander von Humboldt, who appointed out that creating a canal at this location was ideal due to its close proximity to the port of Veracruz, which would allow for the rapid growth of reliable shipping back to Europe. Now, once Mexico gained its independence, the idea began to be looked at more seriously as a way to boost its young economy. But by now, not as a canal dug between the oceans, but rather a system of railroads connecting the ports. Inspired by the rails being constructed in Western Europe in the early 1800s, several Mexican presidents in a row announced various plans to build railway systems connecting important cities with Veracruz almost always a top priority. But not a single one of those projects ever made it off the drawing board. Then came a man named Jose de Garay, who struck a deal with the Mexican government that if he were able to secure funding and create the channel, he would be entitled to a significant portion of its profits for 50 years. Through months of surveying, Garay scrapped the rail plan and settled on the idea of digging canals to connect local rivers and lakes in order to carve a path through the land. The project seemed feasible and affordable, and he was even given a task force of a few hundred convicts to use as free labor. But still, nothing was ever built. Gray eventually sold the canal rights to a British firm who decided that rails were actually the better idea, but then they sold it to some American entrepreneurs. And once this group had assembled a team of engineers to survey the area, the Mexican government suddenly stepped in and claimed that Gray had never sold the rights properly and that the project still belonged to Mexico. Really long story short here, nobody ever got started, even after the discovery of gold in California, which meant that such a canal would receive loads of business facilitating shipping between the US East and West Coasts. The Mexican-American War a brief civil war and numerous other conflicts and tensions hampered 
any chance of the project getting off the ground, and it wouldn't be until the late 1800s that Mexico would finally be in a position of enough political stability to actually get started. With proper funding and a private English company, the Ocean Connecting Railway finally began to come together, and by 1894, the first line had finally been finished. The first rail line connected the cities of Salina Cruz and Coatzacoalos, allowing you to depart from the coast of one ocean at six o'clock in the morning and arrive at the other at four in the afternoon. Over the following years, the rails were bolstered, finally reaching a point where they could reliably deliver large shipping containers between the coasts, inaugurated by the transport of 11,000 tons of Hawaiian sugar, which was first unloaded on the Pacific half, shipped across on a train, and picked up by an American ship on the Atlantic half to continue the journey to New York. It was an incredible success. And into the beginning of the 20th century, the railway transported hundreds of thousands of tons of cargo every year, mostly between New York and Hawaii, and the coastal towns that it connected were booming, transforming them from small fishing villages into bustling port cities. But all of this prosperity took a steep dive in 1914, when the Panama Canal was opened, stealing the vast majority of Mexico's transoceanic business. Coupled with the onset of the Mexican Revolution, the entire project gradually lost support, and slipped into relative obscurity. Since the 1990s, basically every single Mexican president has made some form of commitment to investing in the railways, and nothing has ever come of it, until the year 2018. It was here that the government presented a project called the Program for the Development of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And this time around, it wasn't just a vague proposal to stir up the media. They actually got to work on it within a year, and it gained its official name of the Interoceanic Corridor. Renovations on the existing railway infrastructure began in 2020, modernizing and expanding the current rails to not only support modern freight trains, but also high-speed passenger trains. Much of the time-consuming work consisted of clearing out large deposits of basalt, the repair of old rails, and the clearing of trees for the new lines. Hundreds of bridges had to be fortified or torn down and rebuilt from scratch to support modern train cars, and drainage canals have had to be expanded across the entire length of the track to support the jump in size. In 2023, it was announced that one of the rail lines was nearly completed, and the corridor's first locomotive was introduced, Tijuana. Tijuana was immediately put to the test on the new rail, successfully transporting two tanks of hydrofluoric acid and ten hoppers of cement to Salina Cruz. Crowds gathered to receive the train, cheering as it arrived, as this was the first time the tracks had been operational in over 20 years. The trip was such a success that a few weeks later, Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador had to try it out for himself, completing the nine-hour journey between the oceans and reaffirming his support for the project completion. Obrador has declared on multiple occasions that while the cargo lines are considered the top priority for the project's economic future, the passenger lines are crucial for the future of Mexican public transportation, as their success here could lead to more passenger trains across the rest of the country in the coming years, with the hope to model the efficiency of European and Asian railways. Currently, though, these rails are far from being fully completed, with Line K, for instance, being reported as only 5% finished as of late 2023. And the rails are only a portion of the overall project. The primary port cities, Salina Cruz and Coatzacoalcos, are in desperate need of modernization to support the scale of this project. So far, investment into this infrastructure has included the building of new highways, the creation of new access ports and customs lanes, and extensive breakwater systems to ensure the safety of ships in port. By the project's completion, it's believed that these two cities will have the largest ports in all of Mexico, a testament to just how much funding is being pumped into them. In fact, so far, the Mexican government has invested over 70 billion pesos in the new infrastructure at Coatzacoalcos alone, equivalent to around 4 billion US dollars. Another part of the project is the construction of a natural gas pipeline between the ports, which will allow for simpler export of natural gas to Asia. This pipeline will also fuel the 10 or so industrial parks that are being planned along the route, which are intended to be filled by local and foreign investors who will use the spaces for industries like oil refining and electricity production. Perhaps the most lucrative companies to express interest in these industrial zones are Taiwanese chip and semiconductor manufacturers who could also bring enormous business to the region. According to 
According to most analysts, the Interoceanic Corridor has the potential to completely revitalize Mexico's economy, especially the southern part of the country. The six states in Mexico's south are all the poorest in the country, with an estimated 60% of the isthmus living in poverty and as much as 16% living in extreme poverty. The thousands of jobs that this project will create has the potential to lift these economies and transform the region's way of life. To add to the benefits, modernization of the transportation infrastructure has already brought in improvements in local infrastructure, such as water purification and sewage treatment, further improving quality of life for the surrounding areas. However, there are still many locals who oppose it. Between 30 and 60 percent of the inhabitants of this region identify as indigenous. Many are strictly opposed to the use of their land for national industries. More recently, their protests have been aimed at highlighting the environmental impact of the corridor, with the most extreme activities blocking the workers from reaching their work sites and even threatening them with machetes. One activist was even found dead from a suspected blunt force head wound after he publicly criticized the handling of a land payment given to local leaders. Overall, the construction of the corridor has divided many of these communities between those who accept the coming change and those who wish to reject it. Regardless, the Mexican government isn't making any concessions anytime soon. One lead coordinator on the project declared that by its completion, the corridor will account for as much as 5% of the entire country's GDP, and over the coming decades, it will add a staggering 550,000 jobs to the nation's market. It's believed that it will be an attractive option to several world powers, but most importantly to the United States, as it would make for shorter trips for American ships who wouldn't need to go all the way south to the Panama Canal. Not to mention such convenience for the United States could easily lead to future trade agreements that benefit both neighbors once the Panama Canal is out of the picture. Not to mention that the Panama Canal has recently been criticized by several economists for not sufficiently expanding its capacity to meet modern supply, with one director on the corridor stating that the Panama Canal, quote, is saturated and cannot cope with all the demand, meaning that Mexico could easily snatch up some of their customers. However, the rivalry between the two shipping lanes may not be as tense as it seems. Panama's ambassador to Mexico stated in 2023 that instead of considering the Interoceanic Corridor a competitor to the Panama Canal, it should be viewed as complementary and as a boon not just to Mexico's economy, but to the development of all of Central America. This is the kind of project that many analysts believe is desperately needed for the region to diversify its industries and establish deeper relations uh, with world economic giants like the US and China. And so, perhaps the success of this ambitious project was best summed up by Mexico's former Secretary of Government, Aidan Lopez, who said that the Interoceanic Corridor, quote, is an old dream of the Mexicans, and it's now a reality for all the inhabitants. From Selena Cruz to Coatzacoalcos, it's not just about connecting the country, it's about connecting the world.